No, it still runs all the time. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> You're alive. We're alive. Good morning, good afternoon, or whenever you're watching this, I'm DJ Hamoris, and today I'm delighted to be talking with Elaine Conger. Yay! Thank hey. you. <laughs> um, Elaine is a, a bass dulcimer player, um, a music teacher, an incredible vocalist, and uh, has a lifelong history with music. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today, right, Elaine? Yes, we are. We I've, are. I've already said to you, I have no idea what you're going to talk to me about for 30 minutes, but I'm game. Here we okay, are. Okay, here we are. We're doing it. Um, so Elaine is going to be our Mountain Dulcimer headliner at Dulcimoon 24, which is going to be January 12th through 14th. And uh, we're very excited. We're starting to build up the uh, faculty. I just had uh, Melanie Johnson just agreed to do her tablet edit and four score classes again. And She's the boss when it comes to that now. She is. I'm working with her right now on my baritone book. So, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, it's great to have professionals in the house. So, and in speaking of professionals, here you are. You've had an incredible career in music. And I'm I'm anxious to hear about early Elaine as a musician. Early Elaine started at age four and a half, where <laughs> I was tagging along for about two years with my grandmother and aunt, tagging along to her piano lesson. And I had to do everything my aunt did, from horseback riding lessons <laughs> to ice skating, whatever she did, I had to do. So I kept asking, the piano teacher since age three, I want to learn, I want to learn. The teacher didn't want to take anybody that young. Finally, at age four and a half, she acquiesced and said yes. And I'll tell you, I remember my first book had middle C as a sheep. And there's a bit a memory way back in the files that's sheep, 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 sheep. sheep. I, don't, I don't know why and who thought of that method. But so it just went on from there growing up in church. You know, so many people in the industry has had their first uh, performing experience in church. That was me and singing Southern gospel with my dad's family and having a gospel trio with my dad. So at seventh grade, I'm playing the piano and singing alto in a trio. And it just went on from there to where I majored in music. I really never wanted to be a teacher. I got the music ed degree, but what I really wanted to do was perform. And when you were asking me whether I was at church or wherever in my college days, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? The answer was, I want to sing. But, you know, realism, life kind of happens and you get that degree. And I start subbing in Nashville, finally get uh, a full time uh, position teaching because I had a master's class with the superintendent of elementary schools in <laughs> Nashville, Davidson County. And I said, you need to get me a job. He did in the middle of the year, sixth grade class where most of the kids should have been in the eighth grade, but see, you couldn't get a music position in Music City, USA. I had to take classroom. So I was teaching regular classroom topics as well as music for the school. And then I finally, after four and a half years of that, I realized, this teaching stuff is not for me, this inner city school in Nashville, which could be a whole nother talk in itself in the school situation. Um, I finally decided I'm going to do this. So I started playing for an independent label band called Don Juan. We were playing the big uh, county fairs in Iowa and Illinois. I remember Pecatonica, Illinois, Spencer, Iowa. And I <laughs> swear in those two places, I thought each of them could have had as their state bird, the fly. Big <laughs> flies, you know, flying around all the tractors. And But anyway, it was fun. I'm playing keyboards. I'm up there singing. I'm bebopping. And I'm like, this is for me. This is what I want to do. So I guess I've now gotten up to eight, uh, 1990, uh, no, eight, 1989. That didn't work out because this group said, hey, we want you, the band, to go to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan with us from Nashville to play a fair buyer showcase. Now, we're going to be gone 11 days, but we can only pay you $150. Well, Elaine, the only chick in the band, said, homie, don't play that. I'm the only one that had the guts enough to call up on the phone and say, hey, that's not enough money. We can't do it. And their response was, 
well, sorry, you won't be joining us. So we didn't, we get out on the road and have our own van. So then it's the van and trailer days. Oh, you goodness. You haul in that trailer with all the equipment and you load it at the venue. You do your thing from nine to one or two and then you tear it all down and you go to the next place. You know, or you might stay for a week playing someplace. So that puts me up to like 91, 92. I get back off the road. I'm in Nashville playing around town and I get a job on the General Jackson Showboat. That was cool. I also get to perform with the Nashville Country Music Review, where we're you know, <laughs> surveying the hits, like a Branson kind of show, but it toured yeah. around. And that playing around town in Nashville, my hometown, <clears throat> led to getting a call to audition for Faith Hill. And I'm like, who's Faith Hill? This was 94. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 94. And I, no, 93. And uh, I said, no, I just got the job on the General Jackson showboat. I don't have to travel now. I'm, I only live 10 minutes from here. I want to stay at home. Then they call a second time. I turn them down again. Third time, which would have been December of 93, I go in an audition. I get the gig. I have to leave the full-time position on the General Jackson showboat. But I was out for a year with Faith Hill in 94, opening for the likes of Reba and Brooks and Dunn. And right. Right rubbing elbows right. and seeing what they're all really like, hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have a couple of glasses of wine before those stories come out. <laughs> but then you fast forward to the biological clock is, clock is ticking. I have a child in 98. I've gone back into the classroom to get health insurance. But then by 99, I get a call about this fine arts and technology center who is wanting to have a kinder music program and an ORF program. And here I have all of that in uh, my wheelhouse. So I go to the Renaissance Center in Dixon, Tennessee, which is 45 minutes west of Nashville, where I become the senior director of music with like 20 adjunct instructors. So you can come and have your private lessons at the center, uh, take group classes. There was kinder music, had all this going on. Enter Larry Conger. My harp <laughs> instructor, Carol McClure, kept telling me, you got to hire this dulcimer player. He's known internationally. And I was like, first of all, what's a dulcimer? And he's known internationally? Okay, whatever. Come to find out, he had done an album with a guy from Japan. So I guess that is international. <laughs> so I hire him in, um, it was March of 2004. And he drives over an hour from Paris, Tennessee, and he unloads all the books, some of which he still sells to this day, and CDs. And I'm helping him load in and get him all set up, set up his little product table. It drew about 25 to 30 people for the day-long workshop. And I thought, this worked. I'm going to uh, have this guy again. In the meantime, I remembered that I did build a cardboard dulcimer at a National ORF convention in Rochester, New York one year and came back on the plane. You can't put anything on the plane like that now in the little closets. But I had built a cardboard dulcimer. I was like, oh, that's a dulcimer, you know. We didn't cover that in my music ed career, but. So then I'm emailing him after March 2004 to get him to come back for the next year, 2005. I'm not hearing from him. So I figure, well, he didn't like it here. He doesn't want to come back. Finally, mid-year, I get a communication from him that says I had been in his spam folder and he wanted me to know that he was not on purpose not responding to me. So I hire him for February 19th, 2005, and we marry a year to the day later, February 19th, 2006. Elaine is still not playing the dulcimer. Elaine's just tagging along. I'm one of those spouses, those others that come along and they go to the craft fair and they go hiking and they go shopping. I don't even go and listen to the classes. I'm just kind of hanging on. Then we're in Kansas City and there's this camp and I'm tagging along. And of course, everybody knows I'm a musician. Larry was already getting me up and performing a couple of songs with him in his sets. And they said, can you teach something? And I was like, well, I don't play this instrument yet um, or don't play it that much. What could I do? I realized that when they were playing in jams, they weren't able to hear chord changes. 
They mm -hmm. somebody had to tell them. And when they holler out D, G, C, they rhyme. They sound the same. So the first thing I brought to the mix was the Nashville number system. Now, Nashville number yeah. system, they, they think they invented it, but I'll have you know that the, <laughs> the, the uh, Jordan Ayers think they invented it, and they have written that book and all. We've been analyzing music since the dawn of music dumb with numbers. Now, granted, they were Roman numerals, and if you go into <laughs> serious music you know you've got to do it with roman numerals kids don't even learn roman numerals anymore so right. i was like we use ordinal numbers the numbers that we grew up with so once you learn how to identify chords and hear those changes it makes sense so i thought i could teach that i'm not reinventing the wheel of what is already being done that i could see in the dulcimer community so i was teaching them like how to hear the one chord the one chord in any key sounds like home it's your pillow, it's your temperature, it's your bed, you're in control. The five chord, because of the notes that are in a five chord, it contains the leading tone, which is a do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Nobody wants to end there, right? Where does it right. call you? Home no. to do. So the five chord has that note in it. So it doesn't matter what key you're in. When you're on the five chord, it sounds like you're at a bad motel. The motel has bed bugs. Nothing's right about it. You want to go home. Usually on a five chord, it's leading you back home. There's this sense of incompletion. I can't stop there. But the four chord, which is the other primary chord, there's three primary chords in any key, and that's the chords built on one, four, and five. Anytime you're on the four chord, it has this feeling of a nice B and B. And if you spell the letters, you really see how it's a, a relation to the one chord because it has the name of the key you're in in that four chord. So let's just say we're going for the teachable moment now. We probably didn't want to go here, DJ. I think you're teaching this class at Dulcimer, and that's what I think. Well, and that's how <laughs> that here chord, there chord, that's just how this all came about was Kansas City because I just taught it off the cuff. So I was explaining, okay, what's the main chord you guys play on the Dulcimer? Well, we all know that's a D on the Mountain Dulcimer. And then I explained to them how to spell all three notes of a complete D triad. We don't normally get to do that on the dulcimer unless we play a different shape of a chord. So I explain how that's D, F sharp, and A. We already talked about the five chord, D, E, F, A is our five. So when you spell out those three notes in an A chord, A, C sharp, there's that note that leads us back home, and E. So A is in that D chord. First cousin, right? You get to the G chord, our four chord, we play that a lot, G, B, D, D. It shares the name of the key you're in. No matter what key you're in, this works on the four chord. So wow. the reason it has a feeling of rest is because it has home base in it. It's like a sibling. It's not. It's it's closer than a first cousin, genetically. So, <laughs> although in a jam, people aren't going to just stop on a chord and let you figure it out. That's how you, one way to learn to hear, in addition to listening to the bass line. But for instance, if you're playing a, a two chord song like, um, Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me, for I belong to. Now, everybody in the room, you know where the song goes, but the feeling of holding on to that chord is just like, I can't stop there. I belong to somebody. Now in a jam, you're not gonna stop, but when you are learning and you just let that chord hang in the air, you start to begin to learn, oh, and every song you're figuring out the same way with the occasional color chords with those minor chords. So Kansas City is where that started. And then <laughs> as I, cause I discovered the bass dulcimer because face it, most everybody knows I'm married to Larry Conger. He is the king of melodies on the dulcimer. He is very melody driven, even though he was a percussion major in college. <laughs> um, he's very melody driven and that melody is so important. And I was like, he won the national championship and how many times I've introduced him as the former 98 national champion, blah, blah, blah. Who wants to compete with that on a daily basis, right? Not me. So I discovered the bass dulcimer 
which is only an octave lower than what he's doing, and I realize I can be his band. I am complimenting what he's doing. It's making it fun. I'm adding to what he's doing, giving him a good foundation, and now he really, he misses me when I'm not there. <laughs> and that is when I discovered that feeling that I am adding to what's already happening on a standard, then it's like light bulbs. And then when you hear the jams and everybody's playing the same song, ching, check a ching, check a ching, everybody's playing the same thing. And then when everybody knows it, they all get faster. If everybody's confident, ah, the room can go together faster. If one person can't do it, but Ross and I were talking about this yesterday. Uh, if one person in the class can't go faster, then the class can't really speed up. But if they all know it, here comes the train, buddy. Yep. So I was noticing that and thought, what can I add to the dulcimer community that's not being done? And that was learning how to be the bass player. If the upright bass player showed up for the jam, what would he or she be doing? That's what I try to sim emulate on the bass dulcimer, even though we're not in true range of a real bass player. Now, when yeah. I say that, I mean electric bass player, upright bass player. Yeah. We're not really in the same octave. So we can emulate that. We can try to be the bass player, but because we're only an octave away, we can also be the band. We can be the accompaniment we, with the arpeggios. We can add fill lines, little harmony lines, while also keeping the bass line going. That's what I discovered when I was playing with just Larry, and that's what I discovered that the dulcimer community needed. So that's what I'm about now as far as my dulcimer journey. Get my thumb back. Yeah, y'all. Yeah. Surgical cast. Get my thumb back, but I've got four fingers here. I can play like Steve Seifert and Aaron O'Rourke. <laughs> I can still do. I just can't use my thumb right now. And yeah, I got the right hand in my future. But there is hope, people. Without old Arthur in the thumb joints, which I understand is so common with women of a certain age. Whatever. <laughs> that, um, I'll get this cast off April 4th and go from there. So that's my, that's the journey. That's it. Wow. Wow. You were wondering what you were going to talk about. I just have to sit here and let you go. <laughs> well, my family has always called me a ham, and I guess I am. You know, I'll have to tell you and Erin May that I'm so proud of what you guys are doing Aww. with this woman led and showcasing women event that I want to do something for you right quick. Can I just kind of change the plan here for a minute? Yes, please. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be cool and change. The, there's my keyboard. But you see there's some lyrics there. I want to zoom in on that. Ding, 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 ding. And I want to, uh, I think this could be your new theme song, DJ. All right, here we go. <laughs> I see a Tulsi moon horizon. <laughs> I see women on their way. I see teaching and advising. I see music played today. Don't go around their light unless you like things bright. There's a Dulcie Moon on the rise. Don't go around their light unless you like things bright. There's your theme song. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> this falls under with my family that she's a true ham, not just a ham, a whole shoulder. So. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to have you record that and uh, have Larry play and you do the bass on it. I'm just telling when you, you I, just, good. I was so impressed that you guys are doing this and then to hear the stories of all the people that you have interviewed i'm just like so many of them came out of dulcimer you mm. you know they got their started to, you know it's just like dj we had you come all the way across the country and teach at dulcimer you and then you got hired all of these different other places didn't you what at that it's like a mama bear kind of situation <laughs> but then to hear you know uh Melanie's journey, Lori also books journey, it just all of those. It's like, wow. And then you get to the send in the music bunch. 
Then all of those song leaders started at Dulcimer U. Judy House started at Dulcimer U, and now she's an in-demand instructor all over the country. I think we figured out that this was a pretty good thing. If you focus on education and this lifelong learning aspect, we're kind of music therapy for the, I don't want to say geriatric, but you know, our generation, you know, we are keeping your mind occupied. We're increasing the level of the social interaction in ways that only music can do. And then how Lori also Brooke is pointing out, you know, pulling out those songs for Ukraine. Now, Butros has recorded an album that's using actual people in Ukraine singing folk songs. Mm. And he's put, uh, it's amazing. So I feel very fortunate that I found Larry. I always say I'm married into this dulcimer community. And it has been such a blessing and it's still blessing. And I'm very thankful for Zoom that during the pandemic, I mean, Larry and I were already teaching our private students on Zoom. So it wasn't a tremendous learning curve except for doing classes. But it's like we have been able to stay in connection even more than we did flying and driving to all the festivals around the country. So I think we are blessed. We are. Country. We really are. The, and now the, thanks for you guys, you know, really pushing what women have done for this community. Well, if it wasn't for the pandemic and the way that things had, this community pivoted on a dime, on a dime. Who knew we could get people who really did not want to do this to do this, you know? And um, it was just such an important part of all of our lives that it was, you know, just push through that learning curve, mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever the resistance is. And um, with quarantine, I, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Getting the, uh, Jess Dickinson told all of us teachers at one of our online meetings that they'd done a survey of the 2000 people who had um, participated. And the top in, answer is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the, the question was, um, have you ever participated in an in-person festival? Of the 2000, 1600 had never been to an in-person festival. Isn't amazing, amazing. This is here to stay. And that's what got me thinking about, well, there's room for a smaller event that has a focus on the women. Um, I've always done women's stuff. Women's studies was my minor in college. And it's mainly, you know, you know I, I'm a hippie. What can I do? <laughs> I'm a feminist hippie from California. Just, you know, sue me. Work with me. Work with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and the fact is that we all have mothers and sisters and um, friends and cousins and wives and daughters and you know, it's really important to access that aspect of life in a positive way. And um, the women in this, mostly the, the people that we teach are over 50 and white hair, you know? You know, I think um, men will get more into a gross motor uh, hobby, woodworking, you know, something where it takes their full hands. Mm -hmm. Women, we like to sew and quilt and those kind of things. So it's easier for us to go to a fine motor hobby. Yeah. If you have your thumbs, that is. <laughs> Can you tell this has been hard, but I'm yeah. going to live. But we would not have met that 1,600 people had not Jess Dickinson and all those other uh, producers come up with the idea and his initial idea was to help the folks that were doing music for a living right so of course Larry and I were very appreciative of that but see it goes beyond that because it's hitting people that can't travel or wouldn't travel or would be too embarrassed to play in front of somebody a lot mm -hmm. of people like it that you can't hear them play mm -hmm. now for me I feel like I'm talking too much in classes you know when you're live you've got time to hear some feedback and you can kind of tell read the room you can't read a zoom room that well unless you're you're seeing those deer in the headlights look <laughs> or you ask for a question they go <laughs> <You Right. know? laughs> so it's 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 met so many needs. And when you really start your pro and con list, whether you hate online or not, the pro list is always higher. Yeah. It really is. So you are right. It's here to stay. Mm -hmm. We need to get in the 21st century and stay there. Right.
Right. So it's, it's the other thing that's great is that um, every event that happens online is done differently. Yes. And, um, you know, with and you've capitalized on the fact that women like to talk, right? <laughs> We're going to get half that time to converse like at the lunch table. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I mean, I, I've had the ability and uh, privilege of attending Dulcimer U and going to like Bing Fetch's very first Key West Dulcimer Festival in 2010. I've gone to Dulcimer Week in the Wallawas now three times. I've gone to uh, a couple of other festivals. I'm going to the Colorado Festival in May. Um, I get to hang out with Erin May in person and finally oh, wow. meet her, meet her can, husband. <laughs> you can finally really hug and not do it through cyberspace, right? Yeah, exactly. But what I'm saying is that the it there's something else that happens when the community comes together. And that is the deepest um, longing in these online events. So that's what we... That's what we really concentrate on. We have like a coffee hour at the in the morning. We uh, this last Dulcimer Moon, uh, goodness, Sarah Kate just on her own at lunchtime. She took a a room, a break off room, and uh, did a playlist of Dulcimer recordings, and people could just hang out there and Ooh, suggest nice. things and. Neat. It was amazing, and otherwise you could hang out in the lunch room. Mm -hmm and and have social hour and uh, the playing circle where we get to share with each other. Um, it's not quite a jam, but it's another right. way to get to know each other, right? Exactly. Well, and I'm glad to be invited to the party. I just think it's wonderful. You guys are gonna get, you have earned more stars in your crown, ladies. Aw, thank you, thank you. We're just really excited that you said yes right away. I was excited because I know you guys have your Dulcimer U winter weekend like a week or two before. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we women, you do what you got to do. You, just, <laughs> if you want somebody to do something, you ask the person that's really busy because they're the ones, ah, oh, yeah, I can do What's one more thing? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we'll make it happen. That's right. That's right. Well, one of the things that we're starting to do in the group, and we haven't, we haven't started it yet we're starting next week is we're going to be putting uh putting out a couple times a month a challenge to the folks in the dulce moon group something like work the f sharp major into something you're playing whether you're on hammer dulcimer or mountain dulcimer work the f sharp minor in there see what happens with that or uh take a tune that you have only sung and work it out on your instrument either an accompanying part or the melody, something like that. What sort of challenge would you give to a really broad group of musicians mm -hmm. as far as their abilities and their instruments? What sort of challenge would you like to see? First of all, when you announce that challenge, explain to them how F sharp minor is simply a first cousin of the, the A chord. So think about replacing your A chord with that and just try it out. So that would be an added to the challenge. Cool. I think that I would in, uh, encourage folks to really listen for chord changes, not mm -hmm. depend on the chord symbols on a tab or in sheet music, really try to hear, hear when you're just hearing a song on the radio, of course, if you're listening to pop and or today's country, you're really looking for four chords repeated over and over ad nauseum. So today's music's not so hard. But try to listen for those chord changes because listening for those changes matters not what key you're in because the function of those chords sound the same, sound, or sound the same between keys. So I could do um, a regular dulcimer song in the key of C and listening for the changes is the same as it was in the regular key of D. Now that is an easier thing challenge than done because everybody's, I don't hear, I don't know what to hear. So there's different techniques, there's different instructors out there that are teaching it. And sometimes it just means that one person needs to explain it in a different way than you've already heard it 50 times and then the light bulb will come on. So don't give up. I would say really listen for chord changes because when you're in a jam situation or a jelly, <laughs> um, you, you don't need to always rely on looking up in your iPad 
the the music or looking googling it right quick to find the chord progression or depending on someone else to call out number changes or chord names to you challenge yourself to hear those changes on your own whether you're listening in a recording to the bass line watching the guitar player as their hands change to the chords if you're lucky enough to have a upright bass player show up by golly sit beside them if you're playing bass but it also even if you're playing the song that bass part is going to help you hear those chord changes so that's what i would do Learn. Fun. Learn to listen. That's fun. That's fun. And it's similar to um, uh, advice I've gotten from uh, jazz vocal teachers to start with improvising is just sing the bass line. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. And I, when I was out on the road playing, um, it always infuriated me when the vocalist would get up there that's just going to sit in with the band and they can't tell you what key they sing something in. Mm -hmm. Know what key you do things in. That would be another other challenge. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's true. That's true. Well, this is fantastic. See, it's been 30 minutes. <laughs> I told you it was going to go by way too fast. <laughs> Good. It always Good does. Job. And I, I wish you the best with your recovery and Thank uh, you. continued health and good care. And um and thank you so much for taking a time thank today. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'll wave by with my my, my cast and my dulcimer salute. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. We're gonna say goodbye now and um don't leave Elaine. We'll we'll okay. just let Aaron May uh stop the live stream and this will be available.